I'll start off, start off with an introduction to various public funding opportunities that um, aid small and mid-sized farmers. I'll follow that with a Fair Farms action to advocate for how the funding could be spent. And then Keith Olinger, a Howard County farmer, is going to give um, some examples of projects and his advocacy efforts so we can see how this might practically uh, look on the ground. And then we'll move into the Q&A. That said, during the entire presentation, the chat will be open. So feel free to jot your questions there at any time. And just a reminder to stay muted unless you're speaking. So before we start, I would love to get to know uh, who all is on this call, and I'm sure you all would love that too. So let's start off with a couple of polls and we will share the results with you. Come on, maybe you should put it on the music. get a chance to take the poll. So here's a, here's who we all are. Um, interesting, interesting. So no elected officials yet. <laughs> But advocates, interested community members, farmers, some government workers or administrators. Great, great. Interesting. Okay, well, thank you so much for that. It's good to see who all is here. Um, so now I'll give you a little bit of an intro to the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, last March, President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA into law to aid public health and economic recovery from the pandemic. ARPA funding has been distributed into many programs, all of which have different application requirements. And I'll, I'll discuss four different ARPA programs and then two non-ARPA programs that are applicable to regenerative agriculture and food. And all of these programs can be found in the Google Doc link to in the chat, or just you can just go to um, go to the link in the chat um, if you want to follow along. So, and there's there's more uh, information and links to um, to each of these programs. So, the first one I want to discuss is the SLFRF funding. So, each county and city in the United States received a large pot of ARPA funding through the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund Program or SLFRF. So just as an example, PG County got over 176 million. The city of Tacoma Park got over 14 million. So it's a bit of a windfall. The other week I spoke with, spoke with um, Jeremy Goldman, the Caroline County Administrator, who said that in his 30 years of government service, he has never seen so much access to federal funding. So although this funding doesn't need to be allocated for two years, the um, counties are currently in the middle of the process of allocating it now. So we're going to come back to this in a minute, how we can um, influence that process. 
when we discuss our action and next steps. Um, of course, the this funding, the SLFRF money, has requirements for its usage. The requirements do not list agriculture or food directly, but they do list water infrastructure to mitigate flood, erosion, runoff. Those are prop proper usages. As we all know, and as we all know, um, healthy soils guard against those issues, and healthy agriculture leads to healthy soils. So. For an example, even a small improvement in soil health can lead to an additional 20,000 gallons of water held in the soil per acre. So there, a clear link can be made, but to apply for this funding, it has to be made because uh, water usage is, um, is the most direct um, link to this funding. So number two, state funding. Each state, received its own pot of ARPA funding to distribute for use for relief or recovery. However, with the Maryland legislature in session, it's probably not a good time to solicit funding. But once it's over, it might be. Um, the state of Maryland got has currently um, between 50 and 200 million in ARPA funding, um, and we can influence how they spend it. Number three, the Biden-Harris Action Plan for a fairer, more competitive, and more resilient meat and poultry supply chain. I'm sure they're going to come up with an easier name than that. Um, this just came out maybe a month ago, not that long ago. It's a billion dollar program directed to jumpstart meat processing projects. Could be a physical plant, could be equipment, could be training or technical assistance. Um, the USDA has yet to publish an RFP for this, but they will, and they say this spring, so that's close. Um, number four, local food purchase assistance cooperative agreement program. So there's 400 million for state governments to purchase local foods and distribute them to food banks, schools, and organizations that reach under underserved communities. So I'm not sure if there were any, I think there weren't any state officials on this call. Um, I don't know if anybody has joined since, since we did the poll, but um, Winrock is putting together an open source directory to facilitate connections between government agencies and food system partners. So if you, are not a government agency, but a food system partner and one and are interested in getting connected to the point people at the state government or adding your information to the directory, there um, there's a link from the from the Google Doc or from from the link in the in the um, in the chat and to do so. And the application deadline for that program is April 5th course, the state governments have to apply for it, but you want to get in on their application process if you're interested. So number five is the NRCS's Partnership for Climate Smart Commodity Program. This came out last week. Um, it's a $1 billion um, program that grants, um, it's for grants for technical, and not loans, grants, for technical and financial assistance to incentivize the adoption and marketing of climate smart agriculture and or forestry practices and to quantify their climate benefits. So just as an example, a nonprofit might uh, work with a group of farmers to implement and quantify climate smart practices. Um, you can, apply now. This, this is open for the application is open. Um, the deadline is April 8th uh, for the first funding pool and the deadline is May 27th for the second one. The second one is for smaller grants. The smaller grants go up to 5 million. So um, number six, this one is uh, the Maryland Local Food Aggregation uh, Grant Fund. 
through Marbitco. I'm just going to throw this out there for, you know, kind of the, your long term vision because their deadline just passed. So you'd have to apply for this uh, in February of 2023. But this is for um, this is through the state of Maryland money and it's up to $350,000 in grants for food aggregators and hubs and they're they're doing they're accepting applications yearly. Um, and it's funded through 2025. So they, and who knows, maybe they'll get it extended beyond that, but that's what it is right now. Um, so the next time that that would come up would be February of 20, the next deadline for that would be February of 2023. So um, I wanted to speak for a second on um, Fair Farms, uh, recommended action or next step. Um, we focused on the ARPA SLFRF funding or the county funding number one. As I mentioned um, before, Jeremy Goldman of the Caroline County, he's the Caroline County Administrator, said he'd never seen this much federal funding at the county level in 30 years. So it's a big opportunity. And Fair Farms would like to see some of the funding go towards infrastructure to lower the barriers to adopting regenerative agriculture. Um, also critically important for local food system resiliency. So we did a survey of folks in the Fair Farm Network, including Future Harvest, Million Acre, Million Acre Challenge, and others. And it was decided that food aggregation or hubs and processing infrastructure were the most pressing needs. So we're asking you to advocate for those things to your county governments to see if they would allocate some of their ARPA funding um, to, to those things, to food aggregation and processing infrastructure um, for small and mid-sized um, farmers. And to make it easy as possible to do so, uh, we developed an action alert, which will contain a customizable letter that will populate with your county's contact information, your county government's con contact information. You'll see, you'll receive that in the e in, uh, by email tomorrow, but it's also available at the link in the chat and on the um, Fair Farms website, it'll be available tomorrow evening. So the pandemic taught us that the keys to resilience are flexibility, redundancy, and the capacity to adapt. Maryland experienced food shortages during the pandemic because of weak supply chains that originate far beyond its borders. And we're um, hoping that and we need your help to address it and to ensure that public health, economic recovery, and a regenerative, resilient future. So I know this is a lot of information, but now I'm just going to hand it over to Keith um, to just give some kind of concrete examples of his advocacy and also um, his potential uses for these grants. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I see many names up there on the board that I recognize, so good to see you all tonight. Um, essentially, you know, we have about 10 minutes, so I'll be, I'll be quick, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have later on. So when we're looking at what's out there, you have the international interactions, um, you know, Lead Maryland, We'll be taking a trip, hopefully knock on wood, to Spain later on in the year um, to talk about some international things and how, how countries can interact together and help each other out. You have the national or federal funding um, that's available at that level. You have state funding, you have regional and also local funding, and then you have things at the individual level. And so a lot of those are what, what you just covered. So in, in organizations that I've been a part of, so for example, the, the, the Maryland Agricultural Commission. So Maryland Ag Commission, I served as vice chair on that when, we, when the state of Maryland did their strategic plan for agriculture. 
Um, University of Maryland did a strategic plan. Future Harvest did a strategic, strategic plan. Our local soil conservation districts and our Farm Bureau um, and our county have done them. So what you're, what you're identifying is different things that are priorities. Obviously, uh, she mentioned, you know, food processing, access to markets, you know, meat processing, mills, those types of things. In Howard County, you know, we, we don't have them anymore. And so one of the challenges is for farms to try and do these, these local efforts. Well, there's no way to get, you might have a great herd of sheep or, you know, herd of cows, but if you can, and you might have customers, but if you can't get them in meat form to your, to your customers, it, you're not gonna make a profit. You're not gonna be able to be sustainable and, and be financially sound. Um, and so that's, that's the link here is where if we're doing sound farming practices and it benefits the land, that's how we can access hopefully some of this money. So <clears throat> what we've done here in our county, um, Farm Bureau, the Soil Conservation District, Economic Development Authority, the Ag, Pres the Ag Preservation Board, um, University of Maryland Extension, and a few others all, uh, we interact regularly and we compare notes and we try and push for certain things. So I'm not gonna go over the list, but we have a list here um, of 25 things that we felt were a priority. So when our elected officials took office in 2018, we had a, a change in county executive. We, we presented them with this list and said, these are things that would really be helpful to the ag community. The Economic Development Authority, they have their own strategic plan. And so it was much more amorphous, but these fit nicely within what they were trying to accomplish. And so what we try and do is we try and work with our, our officials to try and get them to identify things that they're able and willing to do. Now, a lot of times it, it has to fit their political agenda. If they are, aren't interested in going a particular way, you're not gonna have much success. But essentially what we're always looking for is an opportunity to make headway on these things. You know, A few years ago, we hadn't had ag education in our school system in Howard County for over 50 years. We were able to get it back in the school system at the 11th and 12th grade level. So now we have a, a ag science committee um, that helps guide those, those education programs at the high school and, and uh, 11th and 12th grade level. And so then there are a few bills that are in the, in the state legislature right now that seem to be gaining traction that, that a group of us are working on this year that you know, we've been working on for almost seven years and they finally, you know, the stars aligned and there's a chance there. So what I recommend to everybody is to build a relationship. And I don't mean you just show up when you need something, build a real relationship with your elected officials and the, 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 the people in these various agencies, like in our county, the Department of Planning and Zoning, uh, DILP, the Department of Licensing and Permitting. Uh, because if something if something does become available, just just like she mentioned, with uh, this money suddenly becoming a windfall that was available, if and when something does become available, it's important to be able to have those relationships that you can reach out. They know who you are. There's a there's actual real interaction there. Many of these elected officials have been out to our farm. You know, they'll take my call. They'll answer my emails. Uh, so uh, in this case, particularly with this. Jennifer Jones is the chief of staff for Calvin Ball, our county executive. I reached out to her. We had a meeting in December. Um, and right now we're going to have another meeting. I, I got an email from her this week. We're going to have another meeting coming up with Economic Development Authority and the Ag Pres Board um, executive. So um, I, I feel good. I don't know how much it's, it's going to lead to. But right now they've, um, they've dedicated, I believe, $23 million of the 60-some that Howard County got. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's a chance, it's a better chance than we had. Um, the, the challenge is, is that there's a lot that needs to be done in order to get something like say a meat processing facility. We don't have any, so we're starting from scratch. So if we want to do it in the County, you have to have access to a plot of land. You have to have some entity that's willing to do the, do the effort, a business, a business that wants to expand and move into our county. You have to have support for the zoning and for the permitting in order to be allowed to do it. In order to get that money, obviously, we've got to have various agencies and entities 
putting money out there, but then you also have to have investors, people that are willing to put the money in. And then ultimately at the end of the day, you have to have citizens that are willing to shop there. One of the reasons why we don't have meat processing is because everybody stopped shopping at the butcher shops and went to the grocery store. And that's fine, but then that's that's meat that's not in the local system, that's in a national system or, or an international system. And so um, at the end of the day, the, the, the population has to support it being there because you have a lot of groups that'll say, oh, I don't want a, I don't want a processing facility in my backyard, so I don't want it. But they, they didn't like when the grocery stores ran empty either. So they have to pick and choose. So I'll leave it at that um, and let, you know, and, and I'm happy to answer any more questions at the end, but that's, that's the goals that we have here for our county trying to access some of the funding so that we can take steps to get some of these infrastructure situations here in the county. Thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to just throw out the idea that when we, are discussing um, food aggregation hubs and, and processing, a lot of that can be done um, in collaboration with each other. So, it, so if you had some sort of food hub, then it could also contain um, like some machinery that could be used for processing or value added. Um, or a kitchen that, um, like a, a, like a, you know, a kitchen that people could use to um, create like products, value-added products, an incubator um, for value-added products. So, um, like all of these things could be sort of adjacent to each other, um, and. Um, they're, they're doing something or trying to do something similar to that in, in Southern Maryland. Um, so now I want to just open it up for questions. Um, I'd love to hear what you have, what, you know, any questions that you have about any of these programs and um, any feedback you might have on the action. And then I'd love to know if you're interested in collaborating on a project um, for any of these sources of funding and what areas of interest, what areas of int uh, er areas interest you most. So um, you can go ahead and raise your hands or if you'd rather you can type it in the chat. Okay. Now I've got to, how do I do this? <laughs> I don't know how to raise hand. Okay, Cleo, go ahead. And so I'm in Talbot County, Midshore, and uh, this is great. Thank you for putting this together. Um, uh, and, and as a farmer, and as someone who's been interested in developing food hubs for a long time, I'd be interested in collaborating with anybody else on the Midshore or elsewhere who's looking for other farmers to collaborate. I do have a question. We have the good fortune to have a, a a, a solid group of folks who want to do or trying to put together meat processing on the mid shore. And, you know, I've, I've heard it said that, uh, and, and so I'm, we're all going to have to de deal with this issue because the, it, the observation has been made that because this is not a direct tie and it's indirect, that a lot of municipalities are expressing cons reservations about putting this on their list, these, these kinds of projects that are more loosely tied, um, I guess because leaders didn't have the foresight to tie it more directly, um, that they are reluctant to allocate their seemingly unlimited but always limited funds to projects that are not as directly tied. And so there's a, 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 there's a concern that there's gonna be a pullback of the funds in the future because it's ultimately determined that that's not a direct tie to what the stated goals are. How are we all in throughout all of our counties in the state dealing with that issue and getting municipalities and you know counties and et cetera to not have that reservation to include food hub aggregation processing uh, uh, projects in their list of lucky recipients? Right. It is interesting and, and to me kind of strange that there wasn't, that, that food and agriculture wasn't, uh, Included, right. yeah, 
Um, so that's weird, but, um, but it wasn't. Um, so yeah, so that, that was a challenge. And what, you know, what we did is we crafted this letter. So it's very clear. Um, and you know, it, it clearly makes that tie. Um, well, but instead and, of having each of the folks who are trying to put together the projects in each of the 24 counties deal with that obstacle individually, you know, like what's the effort to like on a on a statewide basis just hit that issue front and center and say, hey, counties, there should be no reluctance to 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 put your money into these kinds of projects. I mean, how are we instead of having all the projects in 24 jurisdictions? have to deal with this issue, how can we collectively address it more effectively so that it's right. so a non -issue? Interestingly, I'll just say one thing and then I'd love to hear actually from Keith to, to hear how, um, you know, what the um, Howard County exec said when, when he, uh, he talked to her. But um, interestingly, Maryland, um, Governor Hogan really didn't give much guidance as to how to spend this funding. And, um, and, you know, and he could have, it had to, it had to go through him. The funding went through the, the state and lots of other states did provide guidance. Virginia provided guidance, you know, like other states did, he did not. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know as, you know, since he didn't provide like really much of any guidance, I don't know as like we can get him to specifically provide for this kind. Um, and that's part of the reason why we wanted to go directly to to the county governments because they, they're, you know, it's kind of, it's, yeah, they, they, they're kind of, yeah, like they, they're not getting the guidance from, from the state. Okay. So. Uh, I have a, uh... I see that there's a question from Janice and then Lisa had a hand up. Okay. Um, and then I would, I mean, I'd love to hear from Keith to, as to just how it went, you know, what, what his county government said when he presented it to them. Oh, okay. Well, let, yeah, let's have Keith answer and then we'll get to Janice and Lisa. Um, allocated in this way to each individual county. I think the counties are going to look at their list they have, and I, I I think that's what they're going to go with. I mean, the I just don't see any way around that. Um, so when when we went and talked, they said, "Well, and again, this is the the chief of staff for the county executive, not the county executive that I talked with." Um, but you know, she said, I, you know, I wish you guys had come to us with this sooner. Well, we've been coming to our elected <laughs> officials for 50 years with these same problems. And the reason we're in this yeah. situation is because of lack of forethought in the first place. And so, you know, what we're doing is what we always do in a crisis in this country is we wait till the last minute and then we throw money at it. And so, Unfortunately, you know, about the best effort we're going to have is the links that, that they made, you know, and explaining, hey, listen, if you want farmers to farm in these different ways, well, then you're going to have to give them access to a way to be able to make money. Otherwise, it isn't going to happen, you know. Um, and I mean, in, in Howard County, we had the Ellicott City floods twice. So it's not that it's not an a issue that's top of, top of mind awareness but people don't want to acknowledge that the things they're doing in their yards and on their soil are part of the problem. They want to blame everybody else. So it's, it's a challenge. So Lise, uh, excuse me. So Janice asks, um, where can we find info on the local food cooperative, uh, the cooperative food program, excuse me, um, and getting on Winrock's open source directory. Where can we find the info on that? Um, it's in the, um, the American Rescue Plan Act Opportunities document. There's a link there to it. Um, I guess we could actually also just share that link in the, in the chat if somebody wants to do that. Okay, so no, I mean, share the link to Winrocks. 
um, Winwax directory. Directory. Okay. Um, and then Lisa have, has a question. Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if you have found examples in other states or regions that have, you know, invested really strongly in this type of local infrastructure and aggregation, and uh, if those can be used as examples when, when making the case for this funding here. Um, and, and maybe if you have, if you could share a little bit about those examples and where they are. Yeah, there is a list um, which, you know, is updated and, and I, I probably don't have the most updated, but there's a list of each state and the different projects that they, um, they're funding with this. And, um, and there is a bunch of, um, I did peel out a bunch of um, things that are sort of applicable to what we're trying to do. Um, and I can get that. I don't have it ready, like right in front of me, but um, but I can dig it out. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it it isn't. Um, there there are, there are definitely states that are using that, that using ARPA funding for that. Any questions like um, on any of these different programs? Anything we can answer on that? Um, one question somebody had was how the Build Back better, how, how is ARPA related to Build Back Better? Um, and my, um, so Build Back Better is um, like a Biden administration initiative that has a bunch of different programs. And one of the, and some of those programs fall under ARPA. Um, and so some of ARPA falls under the Build Back Better program um, and yeah, can be used in that way. Um, okay, I think Cleo had her hand raised. Yeah, I mean, I don't wanna go again if there's other folks who are waiting to speak, but um, just is there any way that you all can be a clearinghouse to like keep those of us who are interested and informed about the projects that are being proposed Mm -hmm. in, the, in the different regions of the of the state. I mean, you know, I I um, I'm aware of a meat processing project on the on the mid shore, which is which is wonderful, and it makes me be able to sleep better at night. Um, but like, I'm not aware of anybody doing you know vegetable aggregation projects. Um, and I would have a keen interest in knowing that, both as someone who was interested in food hub development as well as you know personally as a farmer. But can you guys be a clearinghouse for that and let us know the kind of projects and offer yeah. different farms up as saying, hey, here's 27 farms in this mm -hmm. region that are interested in providing letters of support for your project, uh, providing produce for your project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it'd be great if there was somebody acting as a clearinghouse to help right. build support and build outlets for farmers. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to like wrap our heads around what's sort of the best mechanism to do that. Um, but yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, I know that there's another group, you know, there's a very strong group working in the Eastern shore. There's another group working on, in Western Maryland, you know, and, and of course, like, you know, there's Virginia. I mean, all the, all the groups starting there. And, I, and, and some of these programs are very interesting to um, some of these grant programs are very interesting to, to like the group in Western Maryland, like especially this climate smart commodities program, which just came out. Right. So, um, well, but, I mean, you know, I'm, has a very short turnover. You have to have an application right. by April 8th or May 27th. But I think that's a, a interesting idea, Cleo. I would also um, ask for folks that 
<clears throat> since you're out and about in the state of Maryland to, uh, to inform us, um, either me, uh, Fair Farms campaign manager, I did put that in the comments, but if people don't know, I'm the new Fair Farms campaign manager. And then uh, Devora as well on, on what they see or um, um, going on around them. And then we can send that, send that to us. Um, and then we can, we can put it together and, and uh, share that information with other folks. So I see Scott Sanders has a hand up. Yeah, hi. Hey, Go ahead. A, uh, a farm distillery. So we grow the corn where we make our bourbon and whiskey. We work with a lot of other local farmers collectively doing a lot of collaboration and other efforts. Uh, I was going to ask a question on the... Uh, state of Maryland thing, because that seems to be the one that's the most, I'll say, undefined yet. It just is, you know, applied directly to the gover governor and have a relief recovery hook to it. So do we know much more than that? I mean, just write to Governor Hogan, Annapolis, Maryland, and propose something? Or do, do we, is there any other guidelines other than that? Um, I wonder, Betsy, do you have anything you'd like to throw in about that? Um, I mean, I get, I get, I guess it'd be just contact the governor's office, ask about it and see who the point of contact. I mean, the governor's not going to do this. He's got to right. have. So, and also, as you see, like 50 to 200 million is a big, <laughs> there's a lot in between there. Um, so, so there is this funding and, you know, then there was this question of like, if he was actually going to 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 spend it even or just put it into like a rainy day fund um yeah it, they're they're really it's that that is a confusing one that is a, and yeah i i don't really have very much information on it except that um i the last i heard they you know they were just accepting people's input on how to spend it and just, you know, send an email there. Um, so Daniel has a question. Or do, uh, does, I'm sorry, does Betsy, do you have anything to oh, add yeah. to that? I just added a couple notes in the chat since I'm hiding in the background. Daniel asks, uh, are you all looking at working with MDA, the so Maryland Department of Agriculture, or convening with other organizations to advocate for use of LFPA funds on these infrastructure goals. What does LFPA stand for again? That's the Local Food Purchase Assistance, Assistance Cooperative Agreement Program, which um, is 400 million um, that would go to state governments to purchase local foods and distribute them to food bank schools and organizations that reach underserved communities. So Daniel's asking, are, are uh, Fair Farms or other groups, um, uh, including MDA, uh, organizing around that? Well, I know Winrock is, um, but, and, and that, that's in the um, document that um, we linked to. Um, I think that the best source, that they really are a good source of information. They have a blog that they, um, re, you know, post to and change all the time with information on that particular program. Um, and I, like, I don't think that um, Fair Farms has been doing anything specifically like um, directed at the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Um, not a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in or. Yeah, I, I have a question on that as well. Um, you, you know, I just reached out to one of my local food banks because I recall 
how wonderful, you know, one of my sources of sales was, and it was, you know, important to me too, was selling to food banks that had funding for, even for organic food, you know, at $2 a pound. And then of course things got really tough and they felt like if some growers were willing to produce food at $2 a pound, they couldn't really afford organic. So organic was out the window. But that would be an interesting thing that might be put together is looking to, you know, a, 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 a blueprint that any of us, any aggregation of farmers in any county can put together, you know, a, a, a program to say, we will build X greenhouses, we will build, we will grow X food for your use over the course of the year, 20, you know, where whatever the months of operation are for food banks to provide food. And this kind of funding could help, I would imagine, to pay for that food to the extent that the food bank doesn't have fundraising around purchasing the food. It could pay for the differential between our conventional and organic, if it was organic. It could pay for building greenhouses and other infrastructure with which farmers could grow more food uh, for food banks. I mean, we don't wanna all be putting together different programs in different counties. Is, is there some effort to get some best practice, uh, you know, some best practices together. Um, that one as an example would be worth it because we have food insecure in all of our counties. Um, you know, and it, it's just, it just seems like if somebody could put together a program like that, that could be duplicated and rep, you know, replicated in all of the counties, we could have less waste, more, greenhouses producing more food, more people who are food insecure getting access to food, even getting getting access to, to organic food in some in some circumstances. It just, you know, we're, we're all sitting around these different counties thinking, what do I have to put this program together from scratch? I mean, somebody should be putting together a best practice that we can all share. Right, that makes sense. I wonder if Windrock has or is putting together something like that because they do have, they're, they put together this open source directory to connect people. Mm -hmm. They have a blog. Um, and then I would think that like, even if Windrock doesn't um, actually have a template for an application, you could, you know, crowdsource that. I mean, that's, that's what they're, that's what they're doing there. It's an open source directory. So you could try to crowds, you know, just put out the question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anybody else has any ideas. I think Lisa, your Lisa said Marbitco has a grant program to help uh, farmers aggregate in order to meet volume requirements. Right, the the Marbitco program is um, number six. Um, I, I don't know if that's a different program that you're talking about, Lisa, but yeah, um, yeah the. The Maryland Local Food Aggregation Grant Fund. Um, yeah, I don't know. Me, I, I, I don't know, Lisa. If you want to comment oh, on that, sorry, I'm I'm driving, so I haven't uh, been oh. able to look at the materials you had. But when someone was asking, um, you know, who's engaging with that program, uh, I think that the Marbidco program is at least partially um, an effort to help farmers meet the local foods procurement needs yes. of the state. So, you know, that, that's an organization that's engaging. Um, Future Harvest is working with a number of farmers who are interested in uh, participating in that and looking at various hub <laughs> models uh, and you know, I would say it's still very early stages, but there's a lot of interest and a lot of conversation happening. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, yeah, it's, it's clearly something Fair Farms is also super interested in. So, and we'll be working with Future Harvest on it too, so. Um, Yeah, any any more thoughts on, on any of these programs or on, on the action? If you, any thoughts on any areas of interest that um, 
you know, are outside of aggregation, you know, food aggregation and uh, processing? Right. Well, um, so any any other thoughts from anyone from Fair Farms or Keith? No, oh, just thank you all for coming, and we're all in this together. We're all trying to work and get stuff done, and uh, so just please reach out and talk to each other and interact in the organizations that you're involved in the collaboration that we talked about and the, just keep doing your best. It's a, it's a lot of heavy lifting to do. So. And before you go, we do have a final poll for you all. So, um, so we will go ahead and post that. Um, yeah. I got a I got a question. So, in the spirit of collaboration, do do folks have ways of um, <clears throat> getting in contact with e with each other? You know, do they do? Should we? Would it be appropriate to share emails or anything like that for folks who you know um, want to want to connect or anything like that? Does anyone have any comments on that? Are you asking if it's okay? for us to share others emails who are on the call. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, and Bernard just put the, the info email um, in the in the chat too. So it's info at Fair Farms. Um, excuse me, info at Fair Farms now. Cool. So we will be reaching out to you all tomorrow um, with the action, um, the action letter that, that you can forward on um, or customize and send to your county administrators. Um, and we will look at the suggestions that you all gave us tonight. I think there were some good ones. If you have any more, Feel free to um, email me, email Human, and um, and look for more webinars in the future. Thanks, guys.